Hello, and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar, New Drugs for the Old Enemy, Finding New Medicines for Malaria. I'm Philip Broadwith, Chemistry World's Business Editor. Uh, before we get started properly, I've got a few explanations about how GoToWebinar works for those of you who have not used it before or not very familiar. Uh, it's an interactive platform, and that's one of the main advantages that we see for using it. You can ask questions to any of our speakers at any point during the webinar, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Um, by default, there is a box near the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel, probably on the right-hand side of your screen, but your screen may vary. Um, just type in any question that you have at any time. The questions are really important, so please don't wait till the end to ask all of your questions. It really helps if helps us to get the questions ordered out if, uh, if you can be entering them as soon as you think of them. If you miss any part of the presentation or you just want to watch it again in your own time, we'll be sending everyone a link to the recording next week and we'll also send a certificate of attendance in the same email. Uh, and today's webinar is about the Medicines for Malaria venture and its efforts to harness collaborative open research to fight an old enemy, malaria. With case numbers rising around the world, the constant threat of resistance to existing treatments, it's now more crucial than ever to be developing new drugs to beat this disease. So I'm delighted to welcome along three great panelists from MMV to discuss the various aspects of the organization's efforts, perhaps more importantly, to let you know the various ways that you might be able to get involved and potentially contribute to MMV's various projects. So later on, I'll be talking to Kiran Deep Sambi, who has led uh, projects with MMV Open before she recently moved to Janssen Pharmaceuticals to work in global public health. Before that, we'll hear from Richard Ameu, who's the leader and founder of the Drug Innovation Group based in the University of Ghana, about his journey setting up his lab, how MMV supported him, and why he chose to focus on malaria. But before that, we've got Jeremy Burrows, who is the head of drug discovery at MMV. Jeremy's going to set the scene a little bit. He's going to introduce the organization and its activities, as well as some of the challenges and de of developing drugs for malaria and how you can get involved in solving them. Over to you, Jeremy. Philip, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to the RSC for hosting this webinar, whose focus is on new drugs for the old enemy, malaria. Uh, Chris, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, and the next slide again. Thank you. Here now. So the problem statement uh, and the reason for this webinar is that malaria, like many ne ne neglected tropical diseases, is a disease with little or no commercial market. Now, this means understandably that it's difficult without any external support for a pharmaceutical company to justify a business plan to work on a disease like malaria because it is unlikely that any profit will be made on products delivered, and possible even that the cost of R&D would not be recoverable. So the result of this truth is illustrated well in these historic figures. Less than 1% of all drugs up to the millennium were targeting neglected diseases. Furthermore, when medicines are available in disease endemic countries, they're not always of a required quality. So thus both the quantity and quality of such essential medicines has been a major problem for disease endemic regions. Next slide, please. So in 1999, the World Health Organization and the IFPMA recognized that a new model was needed to combat this market failure. Uh, as such, MMV, Medicines for Malaria Venture, was formed as one of the first not-for-profit product development partnerships. MMV's mission is to discover, develop, and deliver new antimalarials for the world's poor. We operate, operate like a virtual pharmaceutical company uh, and are around 100 people, half of whom are scientists from industry. Now, obviously, 100 people based in offices near Geneva Airport can't do much on their own. And indeed, everything we do is in collaboration with partners around the world. Our cost and risk sharing model facilitates partners joining us in the fight against the old enemy. Next slide, please. So I'd like to therefore start by acknowledging and thanking all of you and all our partners for your contribution to the mission. Next slide, please. Now, I suspect that not all of you are experts on malaria, so let me quickly get you up to speed. Next slide, please. So malaria is a parasite 
And according to WHO, there are an estimated 241 million cases and 627,000 deaths in 2020, with the burden falling on kids under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we've called it the old enemy as plasmodium species are thought to have evolved over millions of years, affecting our ancestors long before even the origin of the human line. There are five main plasmodium species that can infect humans, with the dominant being plasmodium falciparum, as this is the form that is so lethal. In essence, if you're bitten by an infectious mosquito, you won't feel a thing for around 12 days until your blood is teeming with parasites, at which point you'd, ex you'd experience flu-like symptoms with high fever and anemia. Now, if you're non-immune like me, it's likely that you go into a coma and be dead within three days without effective treatment. This is a very serious disease. Next slide, please. So Plasmodium has an amazing life cycle. In the process of taking a blood meal, the infectious female Anopheles mosquito injects around 100 parasites into the skin, and these work their way within 30 minutes to the liver. And after a successful hepatocyte infection, a single parasite then undergoes the most rapid clonal expansion in biology, re replicating up to 40,000 parasites after just six days. At this point, hepatocytes rupture and the new parasites enter the bloodstream. Each parasite then tries to infect an erythrocyte, after which the parasite develops and proliferates so as to increase overall parasitemia in blood by about tenfold every 48 hours. After a further six days, which is three replication cycles, you can do the maths, parasitemia is starting to get high and this leads to clinical symptoms, which if not checked by therapy or partial immunity, leads to morbidity and mortality. In addition, some parasites and erythrocytes differentiate into male and female gametocytes, which then circulate in the body without any symptoms and sit there waiting for an un uninfected mosquito to feed. So an infected mosquito infects uninfected humans and an infected human infects uninfected mosquitoes. So from a drug discovery perspective, we have to deliver drugs that tackle symptoms and save lives. So the priority is to deliver drugs that kill parasites in the blood. However, if we're serious about eliminating the disease, we have to break the cycle. And this means blocking transmission by delivering drugs that have activity on the liver or gametocyte stages too. Next slide, please. So the standard of care for uncomplicated malaria fixed dose, uh, are fixed dose artemisinin combination therapies or ACTs. These are fixed dose for compliance and combinations to tackle resistance. These ACTs have their origins in two natural products. So artemisinin, which was recently discussed in Chemistry World, and quinine, which ultimately led to the amino alcohols and four amino quinolines, such as chloroquine. So the products that are available today are three-day treatments. They're efficacious, well-tolerated, stable in tropical conditions, and importantly, cheap. And they're also used in huge volumes. So Coartum Dispersible from MMV and Novartis has delivered over 350 million treatments since approval, equating to one child's life transformed every second since its launch. Okay, so what's the problem? Why am I even talking to you about all of this? Next slide, please. Okay, so as you all know from the COVID experience, resistance is inevitable when fighting infectious diseases. Indeed, delayed parasite clearance to artemisinin derivatives has been observed in Southeast Asia and now Africa, and certain partner drugs in Southeast Asia are completely resistant. So we're tasked with delivering new anti-malarial drugs that overcome all known resistance and would be ready to deploy in the event of an ACT failure. Next slide, please. Now, when starting a drug discovery project, it's always critical to begin with the end in mind with the target product profile to ensure that the foundation of your project is relevant right from the start to what will be needed in 10 to 15 years time once the discovery and development is complete. The TPP for malaria is the criteria for the combination medicine, which if met, will have the desired impact in the population or use case shown on the right hand side of the slide. So there are two TPPs for malaria, treatment TPP1 and protection TPP2. 
Now, I work in discovery at MND, and so I'm focused on individual candidate drugs rather than combinations. As such, we've defined target candidate profiles, or TCPs, which give the criteria for a molecule to be relevant as part of a combination product. These TCPs have been aligned to the life cycle stages of the parasite. So for example, compounds meeting TCP1 criteria could be used in a TPP1 treatment combination to treat the use case patients with uncomplicated malaria. Next slide, please. So we've established center of excellence assays around the world for all drug relevant stages of the malaria parasite. As projects make progress, we test front runners in these assays to build up a life cycle fingerprint and understand the TCP TPP potential of each chemical series. These assay platforms also deliver standardized data that allows all projects to be compared, which is a critical quality standard for us, working with many diverse groups, and also means that not every partner needs to set up the assays themselves. Next slide, please. So at MOV, we're passionate about working with endemic region scientists and have a range of collaborations in South America, Africa, and Asia. And in a moment, Richard will share his story building up a lab in Ghana, and afterwards, Kirindi will, will discuss her work in particular with the Malaria Libre Open Source Project. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how the current MMV portfolio looks. Uh, and with our partners, we've built up the largest anti-malarial pipeline in history. The good news is that there are products and almost everything to the left of patient confirmatory are recent molecules from our partners, demonstrating innovation and delivery. However, we must not get complacent. We need combination medicines and also have extremely demanding pharmacokinetic criteria as we're striving for low doses and single dose cure or even monthly protective cover and safety criteria as we are seeking to treat pregnant women as well as young kids. Thus, attrition is considerable. So we need to be vigilant in filling the early pipeline, which is why I'm talking to you today. Next slide, please. So how do we and our partners find new anti-malarial drugs? Well, obviously there are a range of ways, but our most successful approach has been phenotypic screening where we test as much chemistry as possible on the parasite to find hits that inhibit parasite growth. We then prioritize these on biology and chemistry and then optimize them to candidate drugs. I want to thank all these scientific leaders shown on the slide who've been integral to this success. Through their work, we've screened over 10 million compounds on falciparum malaria and even built a machine learning tool that can predict activity. Now, this is obviously a large number, but it's actually only scratching the surface of druggable chemical space. And with all the challenges I've mentioned, it's still absolutely critical for us to access and screen new chemistry. Next slide, please. So 18 out of the 34 candidate drugs that our partners have delivered have come from phenotypic screening. And I want to highlight just two examples. So at the top, um, the first example is a candidate drug delivered in the last few years from Sridhar Narayanan's team at AstraZeneca Bangalore in India which delivered the trimonopyrimidine AZ412, which has now been licensed to Zydus. This is a fast killing compound with an excellent resistance profile that's completed phase one. And a second at the bottom from Laurent Fraisse's team at Sanofi in France before he joined ENDI is SAR121 or MMV533, now licensed to MMV. And this is a low dose, irresistible, rapid killing compound with a long human half-life that's completing phase one. Next slide, please. So how can you join the fight against the old enemy? Well, um, each year we have a call for proposals that we'd love you to consider. Next year's call will be launched in January 23. And so look at our website then to see if your work fits within the scope. Next year, we hope also to have a few small grants to help expand the most interesting new chemical series. Alternatively, if you've never worked on malaria, but have compounds in your fridge that you think might be the next artemisinin or quinine, then you can use our artificial intelligence tool to predict whether it might be active. If so, then get in touch and we'll follow up to confirm its novelty and appropriateness for screening. If you work for a company or organization that has a defined chemical library, then also get in touch. We'd love to talk to you about potentially screening the library and working with you to deliver a candidate drug. Finally, if none of the above apply in your 
keen to get involved, then consider joining our open source drug discovery project, Malaria Libre, which Kieran will talk about in a moment. There are many ways to contribute. Next slide, please. So I want to end by thanking all of our generous donors um, and Philip, Ben and Chris and RSC colleagues for hosting this webinar and you for your interest in MOB and our mission. Over to you, Philip. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Jeremy. That's a fantastic uh, setting the scene of, of why we're here. I think everybody's very clear on that. Um, just a reminder, if you've got any questions about anything that Jeremy said or any of the other speakers as we go through, please just drop them into the questions box as we go along and we will come to those at the end of the presentation. OK, so now I'm going to hand over to Richard Amayu. He is from the University of Ghana and he's going to tell us a little bit about his own personal journey and how MMB has supported him during that and uh, the importance of working on malaria from his point of view. Over to you, Richard. Thanks Philip, for, for the introduction and thanks uh, MMB and RSC for putting the uh, <coughs> webinar together. Um, this morning I'm going to be talking to you about malaria drug discovery efforts uh, in Ghana. Uh, we focus on support I received from, from MMB. By way of introduction, I had my undergraduate degree from the University of Science and Technology uh, here in Ghana, now Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. After which I moved to University of Liverpool, where I had my master's degree and PhD, uh, respectively. Uh, whilst doing my master's, I worked with Professor Rick Hostick, and uh, my PhD, I was with uh, Professor Paul O'Neill and Steve Wood from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, in Liverpool, I worked on a number of drug discovery projects uh, with our flagship, or one of our flagship projects being uh, 1245 Cetroxanes. Next slide, please. So well, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy had indicated earlier that the uh, current mainstay for malaria uh, treatment involves a combination of either antimalarials with uh, artemisinin-based drugs. And, and the, the active, uh, what is responsible for the anti-malaria activity of these atomistins is the one to four trioxin core. So our strategy uh, whilst in Liverpool was to synthesize these one to four, five tetroxanes where we incorporate two endoperoxide warheads. These endoperoxides uh, or tetroxane core is actually chemically very stable. It possess uh, inherent uh, activity. The molecule, as you can see, is not chiral, and then there are several methodologies available to synthesize them. So um, that gives us a leverage uh, as to why we decided to work on this. Next slide, please. So um, in 2010, um, we candidate selected uh, one of our first uh, tetroxane based uh, anti malaria drugs, uh, code name RK182. It was during this time that I became aware of MMV. I remember meeting Jeremy at a conference in London where I was explaining to him what the RK is. Next slide, please. So, um, as uh, Jeremy highlighted, Africa bears a lion's share of a number of diseases uh, uh, in terms of the mobility and mortality, for, uh, for example, malaria, as you can see from the graphs uh, downstairs uh, under the slide, you see the left-hand side, uh, malaria, mouth for malaria, and then on the right-hand side, mouth for tuberculosis. However, on the continent of Africa, uh, medicinal chemistry research uh, into these diseases are not fully developed in most parts of, of the continent. So my motivation was after my PhD and uh, a number of years of work in Liverpool was to return to Ghana, uh, taking cue from my good friend and University of Cape Town, Prof. Kelly Chibale, to establish medicinal chemistry group and to work on diseases relevant uh, to the continent, uh, particularly malaria. Next slide. So why, why, why do I choose malaria? Um, as a young child, um, as the statistics shows, 
children under the age of five are more prone to this disease um, as well as pregnant women. So as a young child, I had a very acute malaria, which I was lucky not to have died of it. Unfortunately, some of my classmates were not so lucky, so they uh, were lost due to the disease. What I recognized very early on as I started to develop this interest was the fact that um, for us to uh, have a solution to this uh, menace, African scientists need to play their part uh, in finding uh, solutions to control or eradicate the disease. So I decided to focus on malaria based on my own personal experience and engage with MMV as well as other partners um, to start these malaria drug discovery project in Ghana, where our focus was on uh, search for small molecules or seed organic synthesis. Next slide, please. Uh, that said, uh, malaria is not the only uh, disease in our portfolio. Uh, working with other organizations such as DNDI and Grand Challenges Africa, we have had projects in other disease areas like tuberculosis, trypanomyces, leishmania, as well as the ulcer. Next slide. So, well, the journey hadn't been uh, all that smooth. Um, I was coming from a lab where all that is required to do drug discovery later research is available. Um, but coming back to Ghana, we have issues with infrastructure, for example, if uh, laboratories available are not fully functional, we don't have um, sufficient food goods in these spaces to work. Uh, instrumentation is another challenge that we've had, though there are limited equipment, we don't have some critical equipment to facilitate this kind of drug discovery based research. For example, our lab doesn't have an HPLC, we don't have a mass spec, uh, no LCMS. Obviously, doing drug discovery, you need to buy a lot of chemicals. Again, coming from a lab where you can buy these chemicals within 24 hours, you come back to Ghana and the procurement process is extremely complex, bureaucratic, and usually you have to purchase through uh, third parties who have put a lot of margins on, on the prices, so we tend to be spending more on purchasing chemicals. Um, this, the university systems here are not set up um, because of lack of equipment and infrastructure to do organic synthesis, so we lack expertise in this area um, in terms of uh, biological support, um, in terms of testing of compounds. Uh, Capacity is quite limited, and as a result, in terms of uh, biological data, turnover is quite uh, lengthy. Next slide, please. However, with these challenges, we try to uh, minimize the impact by uh, collaborating both locally and internationally with partners. For example, um, Compounds we synthesize here in Ghana are sent to Cape Town H3D for mobile CMS and bioactivity testing, or sometimes through selected labs, uh, to selected labs directed by MMV, for example, we send compounds to the University of Dundee, the Drug Discovery Unit there, or the Wellcome Sanger Institute, or CLS for bioassets. Um, to manage the delays in procurement, um, we Purchase chemical through part partners in some instances. So, for example, again, we purchase compounds through MMV or, or, or drug, uh, drug discovery unit in Dundee. And most important, last I highlighted that we have uh, limited expertise in terms of organic synthesis. So, uh, one of the things we have to do to, is to identify and develop talented and enthusiastic, enthusiastic scientists locally. Um, so, we have taken students from undergraduate through PhD and, and, and now postdoc uh, locally to build the capacity in that, 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 that area. Next slide. I mentioned about the infrastructure. So um, I've been quite lucky uh, when I came, I had a space, but as you can see in the picture, um, it's a big space with only two, uh, two old fume cobalt in there with no extraction system. Um, so we have been, uh, Asking around, and uh, that's that's just the two workstations in that big space. But over the years, we've been uh, seeking uh, assistance, and fortunately, uh, in, uh, early this year, we had support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which we are going to convert that space into a proper chemistry lab. 
uh, where we'll replace the, the two old film cupboards with uh, two brand new ones. And in addition, we have 12 additional uh, film cupboards in the space. And I think this is going to revolutionize our work here and make the environment quite decent for the team that we are working with. Next slide. So whilst in Ghana, I've received a lot of support from MAV, the reason I am contributing to this presentation. Um, first, they provided me with start points for medicinal chemistry progression. As, as, as of now, we have received over 10 uh, chemical start, uh, start points for medicinal chemistry exploration. I've also indicated earlier, they provided us access to screening of our compounds through their network of assays. Um, they've also uh, provided us with the expertise in medicinal chemistry. For example, for over two years, we were made to be part of the H3D consortium in H, uh, uh, University of Cape Town, where we uh, leverage on the expertise that they have there. They've also supported us in developing uh, manuscripts out of the work that we have done. And most importantly, also uh, supporting us financially uh, uh, for example, to the WHO and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation projects, uh, some of which I will highlight uh, next. Next slide, please. So this slide just shows a selection of uh, some of the scaffolds that we work with. Uh, the, the ones with the MAV codes are the scaffolds we inherited, we got from MAV, and then the, the ones at the bottom are the ones we got from uh, DNDI, where we undertook uh, chemistry on these scaffolds. Next slide. So what I want to do uh, is to take you through just two of the scaffolds that we work on, uh, SFK78 analogs. Um, these are two analogs that came from the Biofocus Charles River uh, Library. So on this, we, um, we undertake uh, a five-step synthesis. So first, we begin with romantic type reactions. Uh, followed by the SN2 displacement to form the nitro. Um, the next was to do a boronic acid, a Suzuki coupling uh, reaction, and then oxidize the nitro to the carboxylic acid. Uh, and finally, do an AMI coupling reactions on, on this. Um, of this carbon, we've synthesized over 80 analogs and uh, the names of those who uh, participated in the synthesis, uh, you can see on the slide. Next slide, please. So the compounds we synthesize uh, from these um, have been uh, sent to uh, TCGLS in India for both in vitro and malaria activity as well as admin one studies. Um, we were seeking to address a number of issues, either uh, improve upon the activity or address some of the PK uh, liabilities that the heat uh, compound uh, had. And as you can see from this table, we have compounds which uh, with an improved anti-malaria in vitro anti-malaria activity against both 37 and DDT strains. But most importantly, if you look at the one uh, highlighted, uh, it's, it's Rosex. Um, here is, you can see that we've uh, maintained the activity of, of observed with the heat compound, which we had to resynthesize and, and uh, uh, confirm the activity that was uh, seen in the phenotypic screening. But we've also uh, improved upon the clearance as well as the half-life have been increased, increased significantly. Um, most importantly, we don't have any issues with HEC, and the solubility has been improved uh, compared with the heat compound that we exist. Next slide. The other uh, series that we worked on was the um, SFG29 scaffold, again, which came from the Charles River Biofocus Library. Again, we do a very short synthesis first, uh, esterification uh, followed by bromination, uh, hydrolysis of the ester and amide coupling, uh, followed by cyclization and Suzuki coupling to give us a final compounds. Um, here we are focusing on the heat compound which has a purity nitrogen. Uh, so these analogs had a purity nitrogen. We've synthesized about 40 of these analogs. Next slide. The other series that uh, we focus on again as a scaffold for uh, as part of the SFG29 scaffold. Right. So here we, we looked at analogs, uh, in this case, without the uh, purity nitrogen. So again, uh, we 
conduct a uh, rumination on the commercial available starting material um, as before, extra hydrolysis, MI coupling, cyclization, and Suzuki coupling because the analogs without the pyridine nitrogen. And again, in this series, we synthesize about 30 analogs. Next slide. So as before, the compounds we synthesized were sent again to TCGLS uh, for vitro activity against 3D7 strain. Um, again, we were trying to address a number of issues, prove upon activity, as well as address some PK uh, liabilities. So here again, you've seen that we've synthesized an analog, which is uh, quite more active um, than the heat compound, which we have to resynthesize and re uh, confirm the activities. But again, if we focus on the one we've highlighted, uh, we, we've, uh, we've got an analog which has similar activity as the heat compound, a superior uh, uh, PK profile, for example, will be reduced the clearance and also improves significantly the, the solubility of, of these compounds. Next slide, please. So to take our efforts in uh, doing drug discovery in Ghana forward, uh, we'll be fortunate to be awarded a three-year grant by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is a collaboration between three units uh, within institution, three institutions in Ghana, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, the Department of Chemistry, uh, all based in the University of Ghana, and Kwame Krumah University of Science and Technology. We gain kind support from HUD, University of Dundee and MMV. Our aim is to uh, uh, improve upon the existing expertise we have in medicinal chemistry, uh, as well as in malaria and TB biology, and establish new capabilities in vitro DMPK uh, activities in Ghana. We hope that once we are well de developed, we will then um, uh, become a hub for drug discovery research, uh, related research in, in Sub Saharan Africa. For these uh, grants, we have been provided with chemical series, six chemical series from the MMV uh, for the discovery. And then we will be receiving both student and staff support, uh, to start student and staff training uh, by HGD and University of Ghana. Next slide, please. So to finish this off, uh, we have made tremendous progress towards developing medicinal chemistry ability in Ghana. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be able to get where we are without the support of our partners like HGD, uh, DDU, MMB, DNDI, and Grand Challenges Africa. Next slide, please. So I'd like to finish off with acknowledgement as a cross section of the team that's working with me here in Ghana, our partners, um, DNDI, HGD, the Melina Gates Foundation, um, MMV, obviously, DDU, Grand Challenges Africa, and now Science for Africa Foundation. Uh, we are generally grateful for all the support over the years. And uh, uh, next slide, please. So I finish off with this statement that um, as a researchers in Africa, for, for that matter, we have a responsibility of laying the foundation. The least we can do for addressing our own health needs. And we can only achieve this by working together. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. That I think is an absolutely inspirational story. And I think uh, I wish you all the very best with success uh, in your drug discovery uh, I think, uh, uh, efforts in Ghana. I think, as you say, the, the more people we can get involved in these kind of projects and the more um, different viewpoints and viewpoints of people actually uh, involved in the areas where, where where these things are most serious is 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 absolutely uh, critical okay so it's time to move on to i'm going to welcome kieran uh, and we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about um some of the projects that she's been leading with malaria uh, some of the open projects um this part of the uh of the webinar is going to be a little bit more of a conversation rather than a presentation so Kieran, can you just give us a bit of a brief description of how you came to work on malaria and ultimately to join MMV? 
Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Philip. And, uh, you know, this is a very interesting question. And like uh, Richard, I also come from an endemic country, India. So, you know, but uh, I was fortunate enough not to suffer from malaria per se. And probably for that, uh, you know, I would have to thank my father who was you know, very meticulous in giving us the daily doses, uh, daily doses of quinine in that, uh, you know, uh, rain, uh, rainy season to you know, as a that could act as a prophylactic. But, uh, you know, again, to emphasize that whenever anybody had high fever with chills, you know, the first thing was get a smear del uh, test done for malaria. Probably it's malaria. So that was the situation. You know, but over the years, I wasn't working or living uh, in an area that was endemic to malaria. Uh, so, you know, uh, but that didn't, you know, kind of, uh, I couldn't forget the bitter taste of the quinine that I had in in my childhood. So when I started working, uh, you know, with Brinbaxi, the first trial that I had was a developmental molecule, Cinerin, which was specifically developed for India in collaboration with of Brinbaxi and uh, NMB, uh, one of the earliest products. And uh, though I was not a part to that, uh, because that was a developmental project and I was a discovery uh, scientist. But, you know, years later, uh, where, then at Daichi Sanjo, uh, where MMB had an active collaboration through GHIT, you know, I was kind of reintroduced to the kind of, uh, you know, the havoc malaria is still creating. And probably most of us don't even realize that that is, that is still a, you know, ongoing problem which costs millions of lights. So, you know, at that point, it was kind of a feeling that I need to contribute to MMB's mission. And of course, you know, when this opportunity arose, so I didn't think twice to jump into this uh, opportunity of leading the MMB open uh, platform and uh, start working for MMB. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think, uh, you know, echoing Richard, there's, there's, there's a deeply personal uh, kind of almost a calling to uh to 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 get involved uh with it. it's I mean, such a, a problem that affects so many people you mentioned some of the uh, malaria mmv open projects um and um jeremy mentioned malaria libra o earlier in the talk can you give us a little bit of an idea of of what that project is about and how people can get involved what the challenges and requirements are yeah so your MMP Libre, uh, Malaria Libre, as we call, is you know is a recent open source project. Of course, there has been an open source project earlier also, but this is more of MMP led, but community driven. That's what, what we call. And uh, there are a few pillars uh, for running this project. And the first pillar that we say is that there is no IP associated with the project. Uh, so that doesn't mean that you know there would be no publications, but the, no no single lab owns the data. The data is owned by the community, and of course there are going to be publications, but there are going to be no patents. And you know that that puts us in a very you know in a unique position to uh, uh, say that it is the project driven by community for the community, and uh, and all the data that is generated is made available on the malaria lead web pages, uh, which are, you know, kind of posted on the MNB Open uh, website. And, uh, and you know, we it is, this actually acts as a platform for open discussions with, within the community, and some of them are experts. And this also provides the platform for people, you know, who are actually uh, working in the endemic uh, uh, countries and who really do not have that kind of a drug discovery experience or mentorship, right? So this this provides that kind of a platform to have a first-hand experience that how a drug discovery project works and uh, what are the challenges associated uh, with the drug discovery and why does it take so much of time, right? And also it brings them to that kind of a network where they can, you know, they don't necessarily have to talk to MMB a malaria leaf project that they can also individually interact on some other projects which they are doing and it also you know kind of it 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 is kind of a capacity building for uh, not only malaria drug discovery but all the learnings that are there in this project can be used in any other project they, that they may want to do in their lab so th this is very briefly, uh, you know, uh, what Malaria Leap is all about. But of course, you know, uh, we have our own objectives that we want a preclinical candidate in, you know, in the open source uh, 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 platform. 
and uh, the again uh, though the scaffolds are uh, put into the uh, public domain uh, selected by mmd based on the profile that those scaffolds have and but as we move forward all the stage grade criteria that mmd has for any uh, project all those six stage gate criteria would have to be fulfilled as for the project to progress further so i think that that's a unique thing uh, uh, that people would learn great and that openness really really helps to uh, to transfer best practice and get everybody involved as quickly as possible and and removes any of the kind of bottlenecks of information tra uh, being kind of gate kept by uh, by by other organizations i think i said it's absolutely uh, especially for uh, people who have sort of limited asset access to resources, say, then uh, then being able to 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 tap into that kind of expertise and uh, exactly. uh, and and experience is is uh, absolutely vital. Okay, so um, partnership obviously is a two way process. Uh, if any of the participants on this webinar are actively kind of um, doing drug discovery and keen to want to work on malaria. What kind of support could they uh, expect to receive from MMV or MMV Open? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think uh, Jeremy uh, firstly mentioned that uh, what all in what all ways we could contribute, but I'll go into a little more, uh, you know, kind, kind of a description for that. And of course, you know, uh, having said thing, this thing, if you don't have any scaffolds and you are really keen and with limited, you know, kind of a bandwidth, then probably uh, Malaria Lead, I would say, becomes the best a uh, way to uh, contribute so for all for all you know with 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 groups with diverse expertise if you're a medicinal chemist the scaffolds are there that you don't have to worry about screening those compounds it is more of understanding or analyzing the data and synthesizing those compounds which are of course you know kind of prioritized by periodic discussions basically monthly discussions and group meetings or brainstorming sessions Right. And if you are a parasitologist or a biologist, but very keen to, you know, kind of uh, work on a drug discovery program. So you have access to those compounds for screening. And if you have very specialized essays, so, you know, uh, you uh, those those compounds could be put into those screening essays for further characterization or better characterization of a compound. So it's not only about parasitologists or chemists, if you are, uh, you know, if you are really working with uh, clinical isolates or you are a metabolism, drug metabolism, you know, expertise. So that is also how you can contribute or even even with, you know, computational, if you're a computational scientist, that is something uh, you can collaborate. And in addition to, you know, and, in, and you know, that that is one way. But if, if you are not really looking into work in an open, that kind of an openness, uh, so, and you say that, okay, I have, you know, maybe 100 compounds, and uh, synthesized, I have a very unique chemistry. Probably those compounds haven't been screened for malaria. So what you can do is actually there is a, a AI tool uh, that uh, we saw in Jeremy's uh, you know, presentation. You can put the smiles in that and see whether there is any predicted activity of uh, those compounds that you have or not. And if you see any predicted activity, so you can get connected to MNB team who can actually you know guide you through whether uh, whether it's worth working on this series or if if you know similar compounds have already been worked on or what is or what may be the issues uh, with those compounds and you know and if there is really a mutual interest uh, so uh, I, I think you know uh, those compounds can be you know through center of excellence at least for the primary screening those compounds can be screened and see you know, seeing that if you can identify some novel uh, scaffolds to work on. But I think, you know, the important point for this would be that, you know, uh, of course, MNB can handhold all these things, but I think uh, more important would be whatever comes out of this has to go into, you know, public domain uh, so that uh, those, those, those data, those things can be further built upon and further progress. Great. So that, I mean, you you discover you you sort of outlined there a whole range of different ways that different uh, people with different expertise can get involved in the project, and then MMV brings its kind of its network, its uh, expertise to to help build all of those things and to to take people through all of those processes and and whatever. So it really is. It really does sound like a a really integrated uh, partnership. Um, excellent. Okay. I think. 
we can probably um, start to move on to the main uh, question and answer session. So I'll bring I'll I'll bring um, Richard and Jeremy back onto camera uh, in a minute. But I'll just ask the first of the questions. Um, maybe Kieran, you can you can start on this, and 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 the others can maybe add in. So what are the biggest challenges for an anti-malarial discovery team to consider? If you, you know, uh, I would say that the uh, portfolio hasn't been, you know, as diverse as it is right now. So basically the 20 years or, you know, more than 20 years MND has worked, has accumulated into that kind of a broader portfolio. But having said so, it brings its own sets of challenges because you now need CVs. Those are truly differentiated. And when we say that we need CVs uh, that are truly differentiated because we want to circumvent any challenge issues that may arise of cross resistance and uh, as jeremy mentioned in his talk right till now we have been focusing on three day regimen but uh, you know and the, but the focus is slowly shifting to a single dose uh, cure so that has you know the 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 compounds need to have very interesting properties with respect to long half life and you know and they they have to have a low dose so that you have sufficient therapeutic index and of course uh, most likely they have to be uh, fast acting. So, of course, these are, you know, these are the characteristics of uh, candidate profiles, but to, uh, you know, fulfill this candidate profile, what initially we would need is a uh, potent and novel uh, scaffold and most likely with a, you know, novel mode of action. So that, I, I would say so that, that is something uh, which we would require. Brilliant. Richard, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yes, so I mean, one of the challenges actually is, as uh, Jeremy highlighted earlier, only 1% of medicines that have been uh, commissioned uh, in the last few decades actually is for, for NTDs, and malaria will take a smaller uh, proportion of that. So I think uh, lack of, obviously, the lack of commercial interest uh, for pharmaceutical companies uh, means that there's limited investment. Uh, R and D to, towards uh, finding new antimalarials. Uh, so that's a big challenge. Obviously, uh, emergence of resistance or so the existing ones um, also are no longer as effective as it used to be, uh, and therefore this is this, this, this a huge threat um, uh, of, of the gains uh, being derailed if we don't have uh, new, new new compounds. Um, as Kieran had indicated, obviously these new compounds, um, the bar is quite high. They should be, uh, they should be fast acting, and uh, uh, and that that's that's the tall axe and will require a lot of investment, and a lot of R and D to get those type of compounds at hand. Great. Uh, maybe Jeremy, you can um, come in on, on something that uh, Richard mentioned there about uh, the the commercial uh, incentives for getting involved. Can you give us? Um, obviously, presumably, it's not very difficult to persuade individual scientists to get involved with the, with working on malaria. It's, it's quite a compelling argument. But um, companies often need a slightly different motivation. Can you give us some of the supporting arguments that MMV can make uh, to encourage pharmaceutical companies to get involved? Yeah, thanks, Philip. That's that's absolutely right. I guess our experience is is that talking with scientists in industry, they're always super motivated, you know, to work on malaria. Um, the sorts of arguments that actually a business, you know, needs um, are, are to appeal, like, I guess, to the commercial, the potential commercial aspects, and in in that uh, in that sense. There is something called a priority review voucher, PRV, which is a voucher that um, the FDA will give a company or give, a, give an entity in the event that a, um, a drug is approved with the FDA against, for instance, a neglected tropical disease. And, and these, have, these vouchers can be used to basically accelerate development of, of a compound and so have actually you know, gained a significant you know, financial value and become, almost become a commodity. Um, so that, that, that could be an incentive for a company. Um, I guess, uh, you know, in, a, in addition to that, there is the whole element of corporate social responsibility. And obviously it's, um, you know, companies want to be perceived um, to be contributing 
uh, to the, you know the world's to solving the world's problems. Um, and actually, there is something called the Access to Medicines Index, uh, which sort of documents how a company is uh, doing with respect to, uh, you know, making essential medicines available to lower and middle income countries. And it's interesting seeing that actually companies do look to see where they are on this ranking um, and that it does actually matter to them um, because of, 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 of the visibility of that. Um, yeah, I think I think I'll stop there, Philip. Okay, you yeah, know, that's absolutely fine. I mean, obviously, there's various aspects that you could kind of look at, but those, I guess, are, are, are quite important ones. Um, so we've got some fantastic questions coming in from the audience. There's a really great selection here, but please do continue to submit your questions in the questions box as we go through, and I'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, uh, we've had a few questions, um, notably from Tito and David, probably jeremy you're the best person to look at this uh, mostly we focused on small molecules today um but recently in the news we've had uh coverage of a couple of different malaria vaccines from gsk and from the university of oxford does mmv also get involved in vaccine projects or how do you see that complementary to uh, to mmv's activities yeah those are fantastic questions so um so mmv is very much focused on small molecules um but obviously uh, you know, we are um, we are very keen to see progress, whatever the sort of the intervention type. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic that there's been such progress with vaccines. So I guess the GSK vaccine, Mosquirix, has been approved by the EMA. It's actually, you know, um, really, really moving forward. And this is this is great news. Uh, I guess the you know, the the efficacy is. Um, I don't can't remember what it is exactly 30 35 percent something like that um and there's not huge numbers of doses that can be made available um it's i think a little bit of a drop in the ocean relative to the number of kids that there are in africa in sub-saharan africa but nevertheless for those kids that will be um that will receive the vaccine this is massive and the and it will have a um you know a, a, a really significant impact on on many people's lives um, the data from uh, University of Oxford, um, which is sort of the follow-up vaccine, this is looking really um, exciting and interesting. We obviously have to wait and see how things um, develop in terms of the later clinical studies, I guess, particularly in the context of, um, you know, protection in high transmission areas. But I guess the bottom line is that we, I mean, at MMV, we are we applaud and are delighted with the progress you know made in this area and obviously this can complement uh, the use of small molecule therapies and indeed there's there's a, a, a recent study with the uh, gsk uh, vaccine and some of mmv's chemo uh, preventative drugs showing um additive uh, efficacy um so a really you know, lovely complementation brilliant i think that's that's you know it's fantastic news all around um, and obviously Im important for these things to all get sort of joined up as much as possible. Um, we've got a question for Richard, which is quite a specific chemistry question. So I'll go for that one because we're a, you know, a chemistry uh, place after all. That's from Philemon. It's in mo it, most of the compounds that you were showing were, were kind of achiral or racemic um, or looked to be from the way they were drawn. Are there any stereochemical considerations when you're synthesizing these compounds? I think Philemon's question was particularly about the tetroxanes, but um, I was going to broaden that out. Do you intentionally look uh, at relatively simple compounds or are there, are there stereochemical uh, considerations as well? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, actually, we, um, we are aware that nature is one-handed, so we try to avoid chiral centers in, in, in our molecules so we don't have to deal with enantiomers. And the good thing about the tetroxanes actually is that they are a chiral, so we don't have any issues about chirality. Uh, same applies to the other analogs that we work on. Um, the, we have had instances where there's a chiral center and then we have to uh, resolve or separate enantiomers and, and make sure that we identify each of the enantiomers active but it's it's not something that we encounter uh, as we intentionally try to avoid no, thanks very much. Um, so we've got uh, a question from Kirame, um, which I guess is probably, let's go to Kieran for this one. Um, ha, is there a way that people who are interested in getting involved can see 
what kind of molecules have already been screened, what kind of molecules or, or scaffolds are already in the, uh, the kind of system, uh, and you know the proportions of say synthetic or semi-synthetic or natural product kinds of compounds, and uh, and how people get involved in either seeing what's already there or or adding to it. Can you just go through that again? Uh, so you know, uh, okay, if uh, uh, there, there is a uh, database on Canvas, uh, and I think we can share that uh, link uh, post uh, uh, post charge session. Uh, so that ha that that has a repository of uh, antimalarial molecules. I'll not say that that's a, a, a very comprehensive, but fairly comprehensive uh, uh, um, uh, repository of compounds that have been screened, and they are, you know, but they they are all synthetic molecules or semi-synthetic molecules that were sometimes a part of, you know, groups that were working in malaria or organizations like uh, GSK and other pharmaceutical companies who decided to put their uh, data in the public domain so that that is there but you know if if there is an interesting uh, chemistry or a purified natural product that uh, that any group or any person has i think i would recommend uh, contacting uh, mmb regarding that and uh, basically you know you uh, the complete uh, database that mmb has cannot be made publicly available because there are sensitivities involved with different uh, pharma organizations involving uh, different projects right but uh, the mmb team would be more than happy to do a uh, you know kind of a novelty search against its own database as well as the uh, you know a wider database and if those compounds are novel and uh, unique uh, so i think uh, that would be a good starting point to screen those compounds and ensure that mmb would be able to help uh, in screening. Brilliant. And a, a quick follow-up question to that: If if people have got compounds that they want to be screened, how how much do you need, and how do they access that sort of screening uh, service that MMV could provide? So you know, uh, going back again, uh, the best thing would be uh, in the uh, there there is a map email uh, you know that uh, artificial intelligence uh, which we use to kind of you know uh, predict or understanding the predictive antimalarial activities so either the person can himself or herself put that into uh, as a as a smile uh, put that in and say that what kind of an activity that compound uh, you know predicted that activity is expected and then go back and connect with the energy team or they can directly connect with the MMB team, uh, sharing the smiles of the compounds that they have. Again, do uh, the MMB team would follow the normal process. And you know, uh, having said so, it may not be possible to screen thousands of compounds, but uh, definitely a few compounds can be screened if they are interesting and novel. No novelty is the main thing, right? Okay, great. Um, so. Uh, as there's, we've had lots of I, I, it's fantastic to see there's lots of people who, who who look like they're interested in getting involved and people are asking questions about whether they can get involved in at different kind of levels of uh, uh, of their career so we've had you know people asking whether graduate students or undergraduates or even teachers who want to do citizen science projects can they get involved uh, or w what different ways can they get involved um, who wants to take that one Maybe Jeremy or Kieran. So um, yeah, I, I think the. I mean, first of all, it's wonderful to hear that that so many of you are you know are keen to engage. This is really really great. Um, the malaria lead project is the is the simplest um, sort of interface. Um, and there are many ways through which you know you you can contribute. Um, if you are you know in a university, a graduate student, or you are in a university and you are uh, in charge of teaching labs, for instance, or whatever, and you know undergraduates making compounds, um, there is the potential to engage with Malaria Libre and um, under you know get a sense of actually is there an opportunity to make some compounds. And to have those compounds screened, you know, on malaria, um, you know, by our networks, um, so that your, uh, you know, your students or you yourself can see a direct, um, uh, you know, impact of the compounds that, that that you've made. So, um, 
really the, the I mean the extent to which you can contribute will obviously depend on your exactly your level of uh, experience and expertise but um, it's I'm thrilled to hear that so many of you are, are, are keen to engage and this is exactly what we need. Brilliant. I have a follow-up question to that from uh, Deneshwa, who has said that he that he or his organisation has some expertise in high throughput virtual screening. Um, they'd like to uh, be involved. Can they get some kind of um, grant for the phenotypic screening, or ha is are there you know what are the ways that someone with that kind of offer can get involved? So the 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 main route um, through which we actually provide funding is through our call for proposals. So what I would suggest is um, in in 2023 to look at the you know the scope of the call and to see whether it fits, um, and then you know then to apply you know accordingly. Uh, that's the most appropriate um, you know path there. Okay, great. Uh, we've got some, got a couple of questions for Richard um, from, from Tito and a couple of others about um, how to get access for funding. Um, did you mention some funding from the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Philanthropy? Um, is there? Did you get some domestic funding from Ghana, or is it all sort of international and philanthropic sources? Can you? Is there anything that you can say about funding in other endemic countries? um to 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 kind of access some of the, to to get started on uh, on working in this kind of project well i mean jeremy had indicated about the enemy country calls that they normally mmb puts out every year that's uh, yeah. um that's a classical one that i normally assess and uh, we're fortunate to get funding from the gates foundation uh support our efforts here in becoming a hub um but um, locally, I mean, uh, there aren't many options uh, locally. I, I did receive uh, some support very early on when I came. I joined the university um, to do this type of research. Um, but there are some uh, funding that you can get from the MRC and the NIH. Uh, haven't uh, been successful with those yet, but those are calls that occasionally come that you can respond to. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, chemistry-related uh, funding to do basic research um, is, is, is quite limited, though, but there are, there are a few out of that. Yeah, and I guess just to follow up a question from that, from myself, is there is there any support out there for um, uh, for people in those countries to try and access some of those funding mechanisms because I, you know, it can be very difficult, very kind of confusing to try and access some of those big international uh, those those kind of funding things. I mean, you, you mentioned that you've you've applied and and been un, unsuccessful a couple of times, which I think would be a shared experience with a lot of people. Um, is there, is there any support out there? Did you where did you kind of or did you have any or, you know, to, to, uh, to yes so, so here at the University of Ghana there's an Office of Research Innovation uh, and Development that uh, coordinates uh, these uh, grant application efforts obviously uh, we could do with more support in terms of uh, our, uh, you know training in uh, helping these grant proposals um, but I mean Personally, uh, I've used uh, my partners that I collaborate with. Uh, for example, I mentioned MOD, um, H3D and DDU have been key in supporting our grant application efforts. But I think that all the universities or the research institutions, they have these uh, research units that will support a grant, grant application or provide um, input into how to develop these applications. So there are some uh, some sort of support in all these research institutions. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a really important uh, point about you know uh, having access to uh, to resources and to uh, uh, and you know the, the the kind of steps that can be in the way to do that. I'm just scanning through some more of the questions. I think we're coming towards the end of our time. So I'll maybe ask just one last uh, question for clarifying um, from maybe Kieran or, or Jeremy. You, a few times you've mentioned the, um, the, the 
that people can use the AI tool um, to, 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 to a sort of preliminary scan of their own compounds to, uh, to look at the activity. Can you give us a little bit more about the, the kind of the workings behind that? Where did that come from? So Kieran, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that. So I, I guess, Philip, I have to be honest, and I can't tell you the precise details of what goes on course, within, yeah. the, within the network. And, you know, not, not because of confidentiality reasons, it's just I don't, you know, I don't understand it because I'm not a computational, um, you know, chemist. Um, but but if I would, I would <laughs> it's, a, it's a Bayesian neural network, um, a, a, a consensus model. Basically, uh, machine learning needs large amounts of data and really we wanted to make make the most of the fact that with our pharmaceutical and other partners we'd screened lots of compounds and we engaged with a number of these companies and so on and and, and actually found out that we, we there were five million compounds and data that we could model so each you know so Novartis, AstraZeneca, St Jude, um, GSK etc did their own sort of modeling and, and then produced a sort of like a, a, a consensus model with all of these aspects together and effectively what the tool does is that you, you put in a chemical structure in the form of a smile string, for instance, and it will simply predict um, whether or not that compound will be active or not in a growth inhibition assay. It's not going to tell you whether it's super potent or, you know, or, or moderately potent. It's active binary output, active or not. Um, and so this is a tool that we really want to use to be smarter about what we screen. Um, because there are lots of compounds out there that we could screen, and this, in principle, it should raise the hit rate, um, and therefore allow us to screen smaller sets and sort of get the same, you know, output. Uh, and so, with any body's compound, you know, that's out there, the simplest uh, way to get an idea of, you know, um, excitement um, for for screening would be to put it into this tool, you know, get the output of it if it's predicted to be active. Um, this, you know, this is a uh, this this is great, and and we, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Brilliant. Okay, so I think we'll draw the uh, Q and A to a close there. But I think it's a uh, absolutely inspirational um, presentation, and I think hopefully we've given um, the people, the audience, a lot of ideas about how they might get involved uh, with MMV through the Malaria Libre or various other projects, um, and I'm. I'm hopeful and excited that that um, you know that we can have contributed in a small way to uh, to advancing some of those projects. So I just want to thank um, Jeremy, Richard, and Kieran again for their time this morning. Um, thanks to MMV for all their cooperation putting this webinar together and partnering with us. Um, there's been several URLs that we've sent out of, of the things that people have mentioned. Please do uh, in the audience grab those before the webinar ends. Um, you, you should be able to get them when you come if you come back and watch on demand as, as well. But um, do if you want to, if you're interested in any of those, do just grab them before the end of the webinar. Um, thank you to the audience for uh, for attending and for your fantastic questions. Um, it's been really interesting uh, getting those through. And uh, just a quick reminder: you will get an email with a link to the recording in a few days' time. And if you like this webinar, then do please check out chemistryworld.com slash webinars to see the other topics coming up. Uh, myself and the rest of the Chemistry World webinars team will hope to see you in another webinar very soon. Thanks very much and goodbye.